Matthew chapter 18. Continuing on then in our study, follow me. We uh, spoke last week in the series of follow me of giving offense to your brothers. So this whole chapter of Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is addressing that statement was made in verse 1. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And it's an odd question to come from a group of people that are serving Jesus. When you think about Jesus, you think of one that's humble, lowly. When he went to the cross, it was, it was riding on uh, a colt, a foal of an ass, uh, a, a beast that was not a beast of burden, was not was not strong, not the type of beast that you would expect to be carrying the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He humbled himself. He condescended to men of low estate in order that he could redeem them, ransom them of their sins, remove them as far as east is from the west, and essentially buy them. Jesus Christ did all that for us, and now his followers are immediately asking themselves, well, am I the greatest, or, or, or is, it, is it this brother, or is it that brother? They're, they're asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And it seems like a, it seems like a selfish question. It seems like a, a puffed-up question. And, and the reason why I believe that is not just from verse 1, of course, but you see where Jesus begins to lead them in this discourse. He says, well, in verse 4, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So humility is what escalates and elevates somebody's standing in the kingdom of heaven. In these uh, few verses here in chapter 18, he's talking about different moral characters that he's working on building in his men. Remember, he wants them to follow him, and as they do so, they ought to emulate him they ought to seek to learn from his example they ought to hear the teaching and receive it and therefore apply these things to themselves this is what jesus's desire was as he marched his men through this book of matthew i believe and we can join them in that same in that same journey so first he teaches humility and he wants to grow them in that second he teaches them to to love their brethren but without offending their brothers he says, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, I believe that's connecting to the little ones that are great in the kingdom of God. The believers, those which believe in Jesus, he says, whosoever shall offend one of those little ones, it were better for them that a millstone be hung around their neck and they be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is a, a heinous and, and a wrong thing for brothers to do unto brothers, to cause offense to them. But now we're kind of getting the opposite side of this discussion he said, yes, don't offend your brother, but he's going to talk to now the brother who is the recipient of offense about forgiveness. And they're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. We need to be not offending. We also need to be, if we are offended, quick to forgive. And this is what Jesus is going to start to lead his disciples in an understanding of here. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. The Bible then says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So he says, if your brother trespasses against you, and I believe that's pointing to the same one of verse 6, that is offending a little one which believes, offending another brother in Christ, if he should sin against him, because that's the definition then of trespass, it said in uh, Genesis 31, 36, what is my trespass? What is my sin? Uh, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 6 talks about the trespass offering, and that was to be made for the sin which he hath sinned. So a trespass is simply a sin. There's a line crossed, a thou shalt not, as it were, and they, they crossed it, especially towards their brethren. They didn't show love for their brethren. As a result, they committed one of the Ten Commandments against them, or perhaps something else. They caused offense to happen. Now, the person that is offended, how are they to react when this happens? When their brother errs against them or offends them? Again, first teaching here, to these that are a little bit puffed up, to these that are not being humble as a little child, is don't offend your brothers. Don't sin against them. He's now talking to those that are offended. Make sure you forgive your brothers. And here's an order of how you ought to deal with those who offend you when you are the one being offended. There in um, 
verse 15, he says, the first thing that you ought to do if you have a brother trespassing against you is go and tell him his fault. Go and tell him his sin, his trespass, where he is erred. Between thee and him alone. Very clearly, go to him, explain your offense and how you were offended, and make sure you do it alone. Go to him personally, go to her personally, and tell them their fault. And it says here, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So I made a little one of these flow charts. I draw a diamond, and it's one of these things that comes to a question. Does he hear you? Okay, you go to him alone. You tell him his fault. Did he hear you? If the answer is yes, you've gained your brother. You, you've, you've become reconciled. That problem, that, that offense, that, that fault that was between you and him, it's reconciled, it's over with, he heard you, it's done. You can leave this alone. You go on your merry way in, in Christian fellowship. If the answer is no, then you continue on down in this flow chart of dealing with uh, being offended. In verse 16 it says, but, okay, if he will not hear thee. So if he doesn't hear when you deal with him one-on-one, -on -one, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So, again, with reconciliation as the goal. Not to go about and, 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 um, and go to those other two. Because sometimes the offense is something internal. I'm offended and nobody in the room might even have a clue. So you go to the brother, he will not hear thee. And so the next step is to actually go, gather to yourself one or two witnesses, again, with the goal of reconciliation, not the goal of causing drama, not the goal of causing um, division or hurt or, or to, to get gossip flowing. No, go with that sincere heart that you want reconciliation to take place. And when you get there, you tell the one or two that same thing, the fault, the trespass, and, and just as you presented it to your brother previous, present it to them. Honestly, this ends up being sometimes a sanity check for us. Because I may go to my brother and say, look, I'm offended in this. And he's like, I have no clue what you're talking about. That wasn't my purpose. That wasn't my uh, intent. Um, I don't even know what you're, what you're talking about here, perhaps. And it's dismissed. He would not hear thee. And then maybe I go now to one or two three uh, witnesses and I say, look, this is what happened. I'm offended. I've been sinned against. I've been trespassed against by my brother. And they may say to you, well, you know, maybe that's not such a big deal. Maybe this is something that you can forgive. You can let go. It's a little bit of a sanity check because if I go to two or three and they're just like, you know, I didn't see that take place. I don't see that the brother's heart in the matter. I don't see that that was what the sister was intended. I don't see it the way you do. Then maybe now at this point, you can kind of reel it back a bit and go, okay, I guess I can just let this go. Forgive it right now, even as the testimony of these two or three witnesses has been, has been turned upon me. And I realize now that maybe I'm overreacting in this case, for example. But this is continuing on with the assumption that, that there was a trespass and there was a fault. And this, this brother needs to be corrected. First, you try. Secondly, you go with one or two witnesses, explain the situation. And it says that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And you tell him his fault in the same manner with those witnesses. Again, did he hear thee? If the answer is yes, your brother's gained. You're, you're reconciled. Everything's solved. No hurt, no harm. It's off the table. You're forgiven, and you've forgiven your brother, and you can, you can let it go, and he can get it right, and, and everybody can move on and find Christian fellowship. The next, then, is did he hear you? If the answer is no, verse 17 says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, in other words, the one witness, the two witness, plus he that was offended, if he shall neglect to hear them, in this matter of a clear trespass, again, this is a sin, this is a fault, this is an error that was made by the brother. If he should neglect to hear these three witnesses, at least against him, tell it unto the church. It says, but if he neglect to hear the church, then let him be unto thee as an heathen man or a publican. So bringing it to the church, it ought to be a, a case where it's public, it's made plain, we have two or three witnesses, this is surely established. This brother has sinned against this brother, or this sister has sinned against this brother or sister, or however else it works out. There was a sin that took place, clear trespass was made, and everybody comes and they hear the story and they hear the account. The church comes and they are able to judge this matter. At which point it's hopeful that 
Has he heard thee? Yes. The brother is gained. He's reconciled. He repents before all and he realizes his fault. And he moves on from there. And everybody returns to great Christian fellowship. The church forgives the man. The brother also feels absolved of the weight of that sin that he's carrying. And everybody can move on in good Christian fellowship. If the answer is no, it says, let him be as a heathen man or a publican. Now notice, though, it doesn't say to the church, let him be as, you know, you know, a reprobate. Let him be as, as some ungodly devil. Let him be as, no, it just simply says an heathen man or a publican. It's like a pagan or a publican. It's somebody that is a tax collector or somebody that is involved in a false religion. Now, how do we, by and large, generally deal with heathen men or publicans? Well, we, we bring them the gospel. We don't shun them. We don't hate them. We don't abuse them. We don't, we don't treat them spitefully. We don't, we don't kick them to the curb. No, we try to bring reconciliation to them. And so that brother, I believe, ought to be treated as if he needs the gospel. Not necessarily the gospel of our salvation, because our gospel is a lot bigger than the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Else, if it weren't, then we, then we would only have 1 Corinthians 15 and a few other verses from John. The gospel is actually the reconciliation of the entirety of the world to that state of perfection. The Bible says that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth until now. The gospel is much bigger than we can even comprehend, I believe. And the, and the gospel is something that is able to influence and affect not just the lost sinner that needs salvation, though that's a huge part of the gospel, the good news, but it can also affect the brother that has offended and sinned and transgressed and will not hear anybody. They're hard-hearted towards the truth and they're rejecting the truth even though so many well-meaning, loving brothers and sisters have brought it to him and said, look, you're wrong in this manner. You're wrong in this area. You need the gospel. You need to be reconciled. And that same gospel, it, that same good news is good for the saved saint as it is for the lost sinner. Everybody needs this gospel. Everybody needs the good news. Anytime you're reading your Bible and you hear something and you see something, you think to yourself, well, that's good news. That's good news that God won't leave me nor forsake me. That's good news that God has provided for me all things which pertain unto life and godliness in this book. Anytime you hear something from the scriptures, you're like, wow, that is good news. I am so glad that God is here to provide for me my food and my raiment and all things that I need in order to, in order to live and be sustained. It's good news that the righteous have not been forsaken nor seed ever begged bread in the history of Christianity, in the history of the faith of God, what he offers. And so this heathen man, this publican, this brother is as one that is, is lost out there that simply needs God in their life. They need God to work in them repentance, work into them a, a desire to, to change. We need repentance in our day, and, and especially Christians need to repent. We need to stop the things that are an affront to God. Stop offending. We need to realize that that is wrong and we need to change our manner as God works into us that change through his, work, through his word. And so that brother is just like, and he and the man are Republican, not to be hated, but to be loved, to be offered the love that Christ has given unto all of us and, and sent unto all of us. And so that's the order then of reconciliation. And hopefully... You know, the, the brother is gained after you go to him personally, or the brother is gained after two or three witnesses go to him, or the brother is gained after the church addresses it, and he doesn't end up being as an heathen man or a publican, one that is, is, is not receptive to the gospel, one that is, is removed from hearing the words of God. So we can, uh, we can see also, if you read in verse 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Quickly over to Matthew chapter 16. And this is the, the of course, authority that's been given to the church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Heaven And this authority given to the church in, in binding and loosing in, in having authority in heaven and having authority on earth in order to make judgments, the keys, as it were, of the kingdom of heaven given to it is based on the profession of headship of Christ. 
In verse 16, Peter says, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus reaffirms to him at this time, Upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Upon the rock that is Christ, the Son of the living God, and your profession of him as having headship over you, that is what I will build my church upon. And the church then, go back to Matthew chapter 18, at that time was given authority to bind and to loose, to, to make decisions that Christ will honor. Christ honors the decisions that are made. When the church decides that, hey, this man, this brother is as a heathen man or a publican. We have thoroughly saw this matter out and he is worthy to be treated as such. And, and, and as a result, you have to think at this time, the, and, and especially into the book of Acts, the meeting of the congregation was private. They didn't just open the doors and say everyone welcome. They didn't just open the doors and, and invite one and all. Everybody was, was thoroughly vouched for. They would confirm the salvations. They would see the testimony before they would invite them in because these were dangerous times to be at church. So what's taking place here is they've realized that there is a brother that just will not be admonished, will not be corrected, will not be rebuked and chastened by the word of God. And when it happens, they actually reject the word of God. And so the church then has no choice but to treat this man as an unbeliever and remove him from the fellowship. Again, not hating him, not despising him, not ignoring the fact that the whole purpose of this order of operations here was to have reconciliation. You don't lose track of that. You don't lose sight of that. You want reconciliation, even as I want reconciliation for the average unbeliever out there. I want them to be reconciled with the Father. I want them to be reconciled through Christ with the Father. This brother needs the same thing. He's moved out of fellowship with the Father because he's rejecting Christ. He's rejecting the word of Christ. And so they go to him humbly and try to get him right, and he refuses. And so he's treated as a heathen man or a publican, and he may not be invited to those church meetings, those gatherings, those, those behind closed doors in the upper rooms, meetings of the saints. We can continue on, and of course they have the authority to do that. And verse 19 talks a little bit more about this. It says, again, I say unto you, he's just going to affirm this again, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So at minimum, Jesus is talking about this authority being given to you plus me, plus Jesus. We have this great power. If there's two or there is a third there, in Jesus' name, meeting together, agreeing, touching on anything that is asked, Jesus honors their authority to make that decision, to bind something, to lose something, to simply you know, withhold something or let it go and, and, and to make those kind of judgment calls. So we then, even as believers in small little groups, too, plus Jesus, three there, three perhaps, plus Jesus, there's a group of four there, have power in judgment. And we have power in prayers and supplications before God. And we have power in our influence. If we agree on what we are asking, it shall be done of the Father. Jesus says, you have that authority. Why? Because I gave you that authority. We all, as ministers of Christ, have great power in in this life and in this world because Jesus gave us that authority. We are ministers of Christ and have great power. As a result, though, we also have great responsibility and we need to keep that in mind. Being given this power, then, must not cause us to be puffed up. Find ourselves back in that group of Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1 that just says, who's the greatest? Look, I've been praying. I've been judging. I have great influence. Surely I must be greatest. No, Jesus here is reminding, look, you plus another plus me have great power. If it's just you and you and you and you that is, is trying to wield this authority and influence and trying to make these judgments and prayers and supplications, you've lost track. You've puffed yourself up. You've esteemed yourself above where you ought to be. We're stewards. We're simply caring for what's another's. Look, all power is given me, Jesus says, referring to himself. All power is given me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. 
Our only authority comes because Jesus has all authority and he gives it to us to be stewards over, to be ministers in. Steward is someone that simply takes what belongs to another man and uses it as the other man would see fit. So if I'm a steward of a millionaire that runs a business, that millionaire expects me to buy and to sell what he would want to buy and sell. He expects me to, 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 um, to, to use his finances for this and that according to how he would do it. In a spiritual way, Jesus gives us commands that are supposed to go along with the power that he gives us in order to do his will in this life. All power was given Christ. He bestowed it unto us for this time in order that we as individuals meeting together with unbelievers, finding power in our unity, finding power in the fact that we agree touching things in heaven and earth. We agree on these things and we ask God to move in our agreement we can now judge. We can now have prayers and supplications answered in his name. We can now influence others. Why? Because we've agreed, we've fallen under the authority that God gives us, and we go in that same authority that God gives us. We're ministers, we're stewards. This ought not puff us up, because honestly, the answer to the question in chapter 18 and verse 1, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's Jesus. It's none of us. It's Jesus, and you know who Jesus basically says is second? This little child. This humble little child. This child that causes no offense. This humble little child that will not be offended and receive offense, and then therefore, therefore be unforgiving to his brothers. You guys are far off from this, he's saying to the disciples. You are, you are far removed from what would be dealt with as greatest. Why? Because maybe he's dealing with actual issues here. Maybe he's dealing with some of the disciples that have offended one another. Maybe he's dealing with some of the disciples that have, have been offended and they're not forgiving here in this fashion. When Jesus speaks, the Spirit gives power into his words and those are what convince a man of his sins. And I believe that is the primary application of what Jesus is trying to do here. He's trying to get his disciples to be one and united and so that they can wield the power that he gave them to agree on things and to do great works according to his will. We continue on in, in the, the lesson here to the disciples in verse 21. Then Peter came unto him. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? I wonder if it was Peter here that was offended because he's going to come right out and just ask that question. Okay, so how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Maybe he's talking about John or here or James. He's, he's frustrating. He did that thing to him. He trespassed against me. How many times do I have to forgive him? He says, till seven times <laughs> you know he's like because john here is at number eight so I, I if i can drop it and cut it off at eight then i'm then i'm he's a heathen man in public and get him out of here we're, we're in a spat we're in a we're in a tip we're not agreeing on this thing and jesus looks at him and saith unto him verse 22 jesus saith unto him i say not unto thee until seven times but until 70 times seven Peter's like, can I just forgive him seven times and after that reject him? Jesus is like, let's try 490 times. 490 times if your brother comes and trespasses the same way against you again and again and again, forgive him. I think this is an example that he's given directly to Peter. Peter might have been the one with unforgiveness in his heart at this time. But Jesus is just exemplifying and glorifying himself in that statement until seven the times seven, 490 times you'll forgive him. And then Peter might have thought to himself, well, that's a lot. <laughs> and then someone like me would think to myself, you know, how many times do you think I've sinned or trespassed or erred against Jesus in the same manner again and again and again and again? And Jesus is just exemplifying, look, if you're going to forgive the way I want you to forgive, you're going to forgive essentially endlessly. Can you imagine somebody coming to you 490 times with that same sin and you are expected to forgive them and 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 forgive them. I'm not going to count all the way to 490. I think you get the point here. We're to forgive in the fullness of the love of Christ and that he has for us. He forgave us our sins as far as the east is from the west. 
So far hath he removed our sins from us. And yet when a brother offends us, we can't even forgive him once for the offense that we carry. And it causes bitterness and it causes strife and it causes division. And God here says your power comes from being united. The two of you agreeing, touching anything that you shall ask and you shall have it in my Father's name. Do you wonder if maybe the church is missing power is because they're not agreeing, touching anything? This man's offended in that one. This woman's uh, offended this one. This woman's upset with that one. They're all divided, and they ought to be united. And the best way to get back to unity in a body is to deal with it the way Jesus has prescribed here in Matthew chapter 18. Sometimes, I think, we don't even need to go through those steps. We simply receive the offense. And I've done this myself. I've been offended, and, and, I've, and I'm, I'm sure I've done this to other people, where I've offended them, and I hear nothing of it, or I've said nothing of it. But I can go home, I can sit, I can think about it. Was that a big deal? Was that something that I should have been heard about? You know, and I can rationalize this, and I can say, you know what, no, I'm just going to forgive it and let it go now. Cut it off. And, and just just go on with my merry way, not even deal with it, but grant the forgiveness nonetheless. But here he says, if you need to deal with it, if there is a trespass that must be addressed, and this is a serious one because they went through all the steps, even bringing it to the church before declaring the man a heathen man or Republican. This was a big deal, and it had to be addressed. Go through the steps and then do it properly. And then in the end, judgment is made and those that were offended can can be released and feel feel better and, and feel absolved of that bitterness that was growing in them and he that was judged shall go on his merry way and the bible actually says that 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 being removed is actually a punishment in of itself he no longer has the care he no longer has what comes with being involved in verse 19 and that's unity in prayer and getting things done spiritually in your life what a what a shameful and, and awful and and, and, and terrible thing to be removed from is the body of believers united praying one for another. That's a, that's a great blessing that you have access to because you're a part of a congregation. And we here can come together and agree on things. And we, we can get things done in the spiritual realm because of it. Because God gives us the authority if we do things His way. So again, we're judging the brother a heathen. We're judging the man a publican. It doesn't mean we're not leaving that door open for forgiveness down the line. It simply means that a judgment was made, a punishment doled out, and hopefully, Lord willing, reconciliation will happen one day. Remember, we got to forgive like Jesus forgave us. And He's always got grace, especially for those that are known as His believers. The little ones that are His believers. Let's go to verse 23. And here's just an example Jesus gives us. Verse 23. It says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. So here the example is made. They ask who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He says the humble little child that believes is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So now he's going to say again there, given pointing to what he's just talked about. He says, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king which would take account of his servants. This king has servants who are ministers in his realm and under his authority. This king has servants who are, who are um, under his authority and stewards of the power that he has at this time. And it says in verse 24, when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. So for whatever reason, this one servant had used and abused what was given him, what he was to have authority over. And as a result, he's coming back to give account and be reckoned in a deficit. Verse 25, But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payments to be made. So the king says, well, you've You've, you've taken advantage of the stewardship. You haven't done under my authority what was expected. Your judgments were off, let's say, God talking to us. Your prayers and supplications were off. Your influence was being used in a wrong fashion. And you now have a deficit as far as kingdom of heaven currency goes, let's say. He says, but for as much as you have not to pay, the Lord says, fine. You're just going to suffer loss. You're just going to 
be sold unto servitude. You're going to work off the payment that has to be made. You're going to suffer in this life in order to pay back the debt that is owed. Verse 26, it says, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And so the servant then being guilty of abusing what was his responsibility to manage and being guilty of not following the decisions that the king would have made with his own money, therefore fell into this debt to him. He falls before his Lord and says, have patience with me, I will pay it all. And the compassion that the Lord felt in that moment was such that he just forgave him the debt. He didn't say, fine, you don't have to sell your family into servitude. You don't have to work to pay it back. You know what? Because I see contrition in your heart, because I see that you want to make this right, I'm just going to forgive it all. Don't let it happen again, let's say. He, go and sin no more, perhaps the Lord said. Go back to working for me, but learn something from this. And this is the problem, is that though this servant was given forgiveness of a great debt, he didn't learn anything from that moment of contrition that he had when he bowed before his Lord and asked patience of him. I will pay thee all. He was forgiven. He was given above and beyond what he asked for even. He just said, give me time and don't sell me to servitude. And the Lord said, you know what? You're forgiven. And he learned nothing. Verse 28, it says, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. So now while the Lord didn't go out to this servant and come at him harshly and come at him with, with anger and vitriol and say, pay that will thou owest. He simply reckoned what was his and when it wasn't there, he said, all right, here's the solution. You'll work it off. It was begged forgiveness, not even forgiveness, begged time to pay it back. And that I wouldn't go into servitude. The Lord forgave him all. This same servant now turns around and goes to his brother and says, Give me what thou owest. Verse 29, And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. He makes the exact same statement that the first servant had made to his Lord. I will pay thee all. Verse 30, though, the response is much different. He would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. The punishment here was even more harsh. The first Lord, the Lord above all, had simply said, just work and pay it back. That payments would be made. Lord, have patience with me. He forgave him all. This servant goes and spitefully says, pay me that thou owest. Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. But he would not cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. How do you pay a debt in prison? He wasn't even given an opportunity to work in servitude for it. Such harshness, such, such, such hatred, such vitriol comes from the brother that was just forgiven much. The servant was just forgiven much more than he even asks to be. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told it unto their Lord all that was done. So here we see that the fellow servants, the, the, the many that served under the Lord, the many that, that were given the same authority and same power and same provision as ministers of that Lord, the stewardship that they have, the many stewards that were there looked upon this servant and said, thought to themselves, I am very sorry for this case. This servant was forgiven much and he's not going to forgive his fellow servant equally even. Not even a little bit. He's going to be even harsher with him. And so they went and told the Lord. Verse 32, it says, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, Oh, oh thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Now we can put ourselves in that position. 
We've been forgiven all the debt that we owe God the Father. We owe our Lord. As far as the East is from the West, simply by faith in Christ, we ask to be admitted into the kingdom as that thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Lord, remember me. Forgive me this once even. And the Lord says, I'll forgive you all. You've trusted, you've believed in me. You'll be forgiven all of your debts, all of your sins. And the, the Lord comes to this servant that had been forgiven all his debts. He says, I forgave thee because thou desirest me. Now here's the truth that those that are forgiven by Jesus ought to bring with us. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant? Shouldest thou also not have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Shouldn't you forgive your brother his trespasses and sins, even as I have forgiven you? Shouldn't you forgive and forget, as far as the east is from the west, the offense that has come upon you? Shouldn't you let it go, as I have done unto thee shouldn't you carry that forward shouldn't you learn from me and see how i want things done in my kingdom the lord is saying i believe this is the problem that the steward got into in the first place he was given stewardship over what the lord had as his possession to do with it what the lord's will was and it's clearly the Lord's will that compassion would go forward in his kingdom. It's clearly the Lord's will that forgiveness would go forward in his kingdom. It's clearly the Lord's will that what is given him, these 10,000 talents, would be spent according to his will as well. There was expectations in the kingdom of this Lord, and this servant had lost track of it. Why? I don't think he had his eyes on the Lord. And when he didn't have his eyes on the Lord, watching what he wanted, watching what he desired, watching what he expected, he just went about and did things his own way. And this was the problem with this servant. Do you know what happens when we put our eyes on the Lord? We become humble as a little child. Do you know what happens when we put our eyes on the Lord? We don't offend our brothers and sisters, these little ones which believe on him. Rather, we treat them the way our Father would treat them. Do you know what happens when we have our eyes upon our Lord as we're serving under Him, as we're in submission unto Him, as we're stewards of the mysteries that He has entrusted us to? Do you know what happens when we do that? We forgive one another our trespasses. Why? Because we are humble. Because we don't expect to be considered the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Because our eyes are on who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We continue on down and it says in verse 34, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Look, he had rendered unto him how he had judged his brother, but a little bit worse. This servant that had no clue of his Lord's will that went and spent recklessly what was entrusted him and did not do according to what was expected him. He judged his brother, cast him into prison and says, pay all the debt. This Lord delivered him to prison and also put tormentors over him till he should pay what was due. The Bible says that whatever we reckon unto our brothers in judgment, if it's incorrect, will be reckoned unto us again. The Old Testament gives us that principle as well. If I falsely accuse my brother of murder and the, and the penalty is to be put to death, then when he's found innocent, I am put to death for the false accusation that I had made. And so here, the Lord reckons unto him what he should have, essentially what he tried to give unto his fellow servant. The Lord was wroth, delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Verse 35, it says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. Deliver you to be tormented. Deliver you to suffering. Delivering you to working to pay off a debt when... Look what's happening. He's in prison. How can he work again? How can he work to pay off the debt? There's an innumerable debt to you in this life, he is saying, and you'll be tormented as you live it and as you try to pay it back. You will not have access to the unity and the agreeing and the prayers and, and, the, and the saints all gathered together and the authority that's been given you. You will be removed from the stewardship that comes from being a, a part of the church of God, a part of uh, the, the kingdom, a part of this, this headship, and under God's authority, and under the Lord's authority, 
He says, likewise shall the Father do unto you. He'll reckon you as a heathen man or a publican, someone that he's not going to bless, someone that he has no interaction with, has no personal attachment to. You may be saved yet so as by fire, of course, but it's a tormenting walk to walk removed from God. And one of these sins that gets us the worst is this one of unforgiveness. The Bible talks about a root of bitterness that creeps up and causes that many to be offended. And we can get that if we don't get forgiveness right and we don't deal with it accordingly. We need to forgive as Jesus did. He says, likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. And you can go through that parable and see what the Father will do if ye from your hearts... Forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. We're expected to give them a clear slate. We're expected to 490 times over forgive them that same trespass which they trespass against us. That same sin which they sin against us. Of course, there is a time to go and deal with things in, in, as far as disciplinary action goes when we're in the context of church. Of course, we're not, we're not negating that. But forgiveness individually in our hearts needs to be something that we seek for and try to give and try to offer unto our brother to the extent that he says, from your hearts forgive every one of your brother's trespasses. You need to forgive as Jesus forgave you. So the bottom line here of this whole chapter, be humble. Because you know your Lord, give him proper place. Because your eyes are upon the Lord, give him proper place. Look to him. See how he treats people and treat them to say the same. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated is the golden rule. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. When you walk that walk with Christ, when you follow him, he makes you a fisher of men. He makes you have influence. He makes you have power. He makes you have ability and judgment. He also makes you humble. You begin to see yourself for who you actually are apart from him and you begin to be exalted in what he makes you as he leads you about. Second main point, don't offend. Don't sin against your brother. Don't trespass against your brother. And as much as in us is, live peaceably with all men, but especially those who are of the household of faith. We ought to love especially those who are belonging to and a part of the house of God. Don't offend your brothers. Don't offend these little ones which believe in him. And thirdly, if you offend, if you offend, well, quickly make that right. Fourthly, if you're offended, be willing to forgive. If you're offending somebody, be the one that as soon as your brother goes to you and asks you, uh, tells you fault and tries to make it right, be the one that quickly repents and says, yes, I'm sorry. Seek forgiveness, apologize, try to make it right. Don't be the one that has to be drugged through the ringers of the church disciplinary system only to be considered a heathen man or publican and tossed out, only to be treated as the Heavenly Father would do if you're that fellow servant in the case of the parable here and you are, are spitefully entreating your fellow servants even though you have been forgiven all. Don't be that one that's treated that way and cast out. Be the one that's ready to, when you offend somebody, ask forgiveness. And make it right. And if you are offended, if you are offended, be willing to forgive. Not just seven times. And to 70 times seven. I believe that unforgiveness here is given the same type of, of, of punishment of the Father. Look what he says in verse 34. His Lord was wroth, delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. He was delivered to torment until he could make it right. That's what happens when somebody is expound or ex give sorry cast out of church because they're de deemed a heathen man or republican they're delivered unto tormentors they're delivered unto the world they're delivered unto the um, the lack of that fellowship and of that hedge of protection around them until they can make it right until they can pay back the debt as it were that's the punishment for not forgiving well look at the punishment for offending it says back there in verse six it says it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Both these punishments are, are severe. Of course, there's spiritual language being referred to here. A parable perhaps being made, especially in the context of believers. But nonetheless, you see that your heavenly father takes these things seriously. So first, don't offend your brothers. If you've offended your brothers, ask forgiveness quickly and reconcile and make it right. If you have been offended, be quick to forgive 
from your hearts, even as Christ hath forgiven you. Thank you, Father.